This is a crisis of epic proportion. Net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. This plan does give Canada the best chance to achieve those Paris targets. You have to vote green if you want a green policy. It's day 15 of the federal election campaign, and this week many parties are talking about climate change. So here at Power and Politics, we're zoning in on each of those parties' plans. Yesterday we spoke with a Liberal candidate about that party's green promises, and today we're going to hear from the NDP. Randall Garrison is a B.C. NDP candidate. He joins us from Victoria. Hi, Mr. Garrison. Great to see you. Thanks for making time for the show. Hi there. It's great to be here. Your party has committed to legislating the targets that you set, which equate to about 38% below 2005 levels by 2030. What will that legislation look like? Well, it's not so much about what the legislation looked like. It, the legislation is the commitment to actually get this job done because our party's plan is the only one that's strong enough to meet Canada's climate obligations while still keeping communities and families at the heart of this transition. I'm asking, I guess, about the details of it, wondering if there will be any sort of accountability, i.e., will there be some sort of punishment, punitive measures in there if the, if the targets are not met? Because I take your point that so far uh, both previous governments have set targets and, and at this point at least failed to meet them. So how will Canadians know that just because there's legislation that an NDP government introduces that you'll actually keep those and meet those So targets? a key part of that legislation is to set up a climate accountability office, which would be an officer of parliament, to make regular reports to the public on whether we're actually making the progress we need to make toward those targets. So you need that independent accountability mechanism Otherwise, you get what we've seen from the Liberals. Now we've seen another promise uh, for carbon neutrality by 2050 when they're 200 years behind on meeting their climate targets for 2030. So uh, again, that independent observation, independent reporting to the public on the progress we're making is an important part of any legislation we'll bring in. The Liberals have now pitched, though, setting sort of five-year milestones and enshrining those in legislation. If there is a situation in which they form government again, is that something your party would be supportive of? Well, we'd have negotiations with anybody about how we're going to meet climate targets and how we're going to move fast enough to get the job done without leaving ordinary families and workers behind. So yes, it's, it's part of those discussions. But you know, you have to say, as we've been saying to the Liberals, not much credibility. You bought a pipeline. You are 200 years behind on your targets. So we're going to have to see a bit more from the Liberals uh, if we're ever going to meet our obligations. Do they get some credit, though, for introducing the idea, almost acknowledging, I guess, what you're saying and saying, OK, we're going to introduce these, this legislated system of accountability now? Well, well, whenever the Liberals are pressed, they like to say the right thing, but they don't have a plan. Even the environment minister said, well, first we get through the election and then we figure out how we're going to do this. I mean, that, that's really not an adequate response for Canadian voters in this election. Let me ask you a little bit about, more about your plan, because meeting targets isn't just about federal actions. Provinces have to do their part to make, meet the targets as well. How would your, the NDP, if you form government, make sure that provinces meet their targets? Well, we said that we would keep a price on carbon and that uh, provinces, again, would have to participate in a program like that. They'll have to take measures uh, to meet their own targets. But I, I think the important thing here is federal leadership. If somebody steps up and actually sets very concrete goals and then shows a plan of how to reach those goals, then it's going to be very easy to get provinces to buy into those targets. But as long as we're talking glittering generalities, then it's very, very hard to bring people around to what needs to be done. Do you think, though, that provinces will buy into something? I mean, we've seen there are there are numerous provinces right now fighting the imposition of a simple federal price on carbon in court. Well, right now I'm in the middle of a federal election campaign, and I think the first thing we have to do is get a federal government that's actually committed to meeting targets and doing what needs to be done and making sure we don't leave anybody behind in that process. So I'm really focused on the federal election at this yeah, point. Yeah, I know that you're focused on the federal election, but, but the way in which a federal government, if the NDP is going to form one, works with provinces on goals of national import is key to the success of those goals, is it not? Well, it certainly is, but we've seen provinces like British Columbia that have a very strong plan for reducing their carbon emissions, and we would work very closely with other provinces who want to put forward such a plan and provide federal assistance where it's appropriate. What does that federal assistance look like? Well, we ha again, we have to get a government that's committed to doing this. I can't draw you a program for each and every province here. What we've done is put forward a federal plan that the NDP is very committed to. We've said how we'll fund that plan, and we've said how we'll meet the targets, a minimum of a 38% reduction uh, in greenhouse gases by 2030. So we're putting out something very concrete, something very doable, and something that I think when Canadians take a look at it, we'll see is a very reasonable way to approach this problem. Let me ask a bit more about how you're going to fund that plan, uh, the funding that you just mentioned. Your plan says that, that the party would keep a carbon price, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, stop exempting heavy emitters and direct rebates at lower income Canadians rather than across the board as they, as they occur right now. Will there be a difference in the price, uh, the carbon price post 
2022 under an NDP government for consumers? Well, I guess uh, we'll have to take a look at how we're going to achieve those goals and what part of that that carbon pricing does contribute. How is that so a different answer than what the Liberals provided to us yesterday? You were complaining about the lack of detail in their plan, but you're unwilling to say what the specific carbon price would be post-2022. <laughs> well, I, I guess the, the thing about the Liberal plan is it has no details whatsoever of what they're going to do. So we've got a $15 billion plan that will start on things like housing retrofits. Uh, it will start on electrifying our transportation system. It will start on all those measures that we're going to have to take to get there. And carbon price is just one of those measures. It's just one of those measures, but certainly it is a significant one, right? You know, you're aware, I'm sure, of the political debate around the price of it, how high it will go, all that kind of stuff. I take your point that you're proposing a whole suite of measures that would get you to your goals, but how are Canadians able to sort of independently evaluate whether all of that will work if they don't know what a significant part of what you're proposing actually will entail? Well, we're not proposing a major increase in, in the carbon price at this time. And as I've said, we've got a suite of measures we're going to have to get in place and we're going to have to make the progress that's necessary to keep the rise in temperatures b below 1.5 degrees. And as an NDP government, we would do everything we can to make that happen. So when you say you're not proposing a major increase in the price of carbon, does that mean that you would be looking at the possibility of one post-2022? And when would an NDP government make a decision as to what that might look like? Well, I, I'm not, I'm not going to give you an answer to that question because I don't know the answer to that question at this point. What we're saying is that we're keeping the carbon uh, price intact and it's going to make a contribution to the, reduce, the reduction of greenhouse gases. But we have a, another whole suite of measures. It's not just about a carbon tax. It's about all those other things we need to do to make this transition to a net zero uh, economy by 2050 and to make significant reductions by 2030. And let me just ask you another question about the funding because uh, the NDP has proposed a wealth tax that could raise, I believe from your own numbers, as much as $10 billion a year. You're not just promising uh, a lot in climate, you're promising you know, uh, dental care for people who earn under $70,000 a year, you're promising $6.5 billion investment in transit, which is part of the climate plan, uh, universal pharmacare, which independent assessments have pegged at $15 billion. The wealth tax is raising $10 billion a year. So how are you going to, you know, have you, have you really thought out how you're going to pay for the rest of it? Yes, there's a, there's a comprehensive plan there, and it includes how we're going to raise revenues. So you've started uh, with the one which I think is most important, and that, that's a wealth tax on those who have fortunes over $20 million. Uh, independent evaluation by the Parliamentary Budget Office says our estimates are pretty close on what that will raise. We're going to stop $3.3 billion of subsidies uh, to the oil and gas industry immediately. Are you sure that's that how, many, how much money is being given right now? Because Andrew Leach, who's an environmental economist, did a sort of more up-to-date, he said the, the, that, that tally is a little bit outdated, that as of now it might be less than that. Well, it might be less than that. It might be more than that. What he's saying is that we're kind of uncertain because of what the right. Liberals have done. But we know that the order of magnitude is around $3 billion, whether it's precisely $3.3 billion. Uh, we've said we'll raise corporate income tax rates uh, to 18 percent. So we've got a whole suite of measures here that are going to produce the revenues necessary to pay for the things we're promising in this campaign. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Mr. Garrison. Appreciate Thanks your time today. Thanks very much. Okay, bye now. We take the climate crisis seriously and we are committed to taking bold action, not just pretty words, but real action, including immediately ending the fossil fuel subsidy, investing into clean, renewable energy. We will introduce a new interest-free loan of up to $40,000 for homeowners and landlords who want to make their homes more energy efficient. As Prime Minister, I will establish the Green Homes Tax Credit that will allow you to lower your home's emissions through green renovations. You will be eligible to receive a 20% refundable credit on your income tax for green improvements to your homes of over $1,000 and up to $20,000. Seeing a bit of a theme there, the federal party leaders may be trying to outgreen one another this week. More promises today from parties on comment, combating rather climate change, competing incentives for homeowners, and promises to kill fossil fuel subsidies. Welcome back to Power and Politics in the Power Panel with Laura Stone, Omar Khan, Kathleen Monk, Jeff Norquay, and David Chernyshenko. Kathleen, I'll start with you, especially where those uh, home promises are being made. What, what is the strategy, do you think, behind there? Who are they trying to reach? 
Well, all parties do this. They look at things that um, consumers and voters, citizens, uh, think that will help them. And so uh, Jack Layton uh, similarly offered retro retrofit programs, and the two parties are too. But they're these kind of trinket and baubles that help um, families at home retrofit their homes to make them more energy efficient have to be accompanied with serious climate action. And that's why you see the New Democrats, for instance, releasing a $15, $15 billion plan, a 20-page plan on climate action like they did in June for the New Democratic Green New Deal. Yeah, that actually lays out a plan. could tell me how high the carbon price would go. So, um, yeah, maybe. but they actually do have specifics like working towards a 3,000, hiring new 3,000 new green jobs, things like actually electrifying transit, um, things that will move forward um, with concrete plans, revising, this is the key thing, revising the 2030 targets um, that we know the Liberals are mi would miss after they adopted Harper's crappy targets in the first place. Um, the reason all the parties are talking about this week is obviously the focus is on climate, not just in New York, but around the world and around the globe, um, the climate strike on Friday that's happening that um, I'm going to encourage my kids uh, to get out and do something for. And I hope that everybody does because um, this is a crisis that we need to face. Laura, how do you think voters at this point are perceiving the promises that they're getting? On these well, issues, I think the average voter is is kind of facing an inner turmoil about these issues. Um, you know, I saw today's announcement as appealing to the suburban middle class family, um, people who own homes and who want to do something. People do care about climate change and they want to do something about it. They also don't want to be personally inconvenienced. Uh, and there's a lot of people living in the suburbs, especially in the greater Toronto area, who have to drive. Uh, they don't have a choice. They have to take their kids around. Andrew Scheer has tried to tap into this um, in his messaging in the beginning of the campaign on affordability. Uh, and so I think there's kind of those dual forces at play here in that people do care uh, about climate change, um, but you know, how, much, how far are they willing to go? And that's sort of the debate that's unfolding throughout this campaign. I think that's a really good point, Omar. And I wonder how you think the uh, Liberals go about, or, or any party really goes about navigating that. CBC had commissioned a poll, I remember, months ago. And it was really revealing to me as well, because it said that, yes, it's such a priority for people. They really do want to see action on climate change. But when they were asked to put a dollar amount on what they're willing to spend, I think it was something, they weren't even willing to spend a Netflix subscription every month to combat the problem. So. I'm just, you know, obviously that raises a whole host of questions, but politically, what does that mean for the party's strategies as they make these announcements this week? Well, it's one of the reasons why on why the federal government had moved uh, to to provide direct rebates uh, to consumers in provinces that didn't that didn't adopt the um, uh, the carbon pricing. Uh, look. Uh, for sure, I, I agree with Kathleen. Actually, here you you can have these like little baubles out there to appeal to retail voters. Look, I'm I'm about to get new insulation in my house. I would love to get a tax credit for that. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's all about the vision and your strategy for addressing this issue. One piece that we didn't talk about yet was uh, the, the liberal pr proposal to bring in uh, tax incentives for clean tech companies. Mm -hmm. The that was Ontario, yesterday's announcement. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the, 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 if you take the province of Ontario for example, when when the previous government decided to make green energy and green technology a uh, policy priority. Uh, you know, we, we often talk about the price of hydro, but we very rarely talked about the fact that that led to about, uh, if, you, if you look at the numbers from the Association of Power Producers, you know, about three, over 300,000 jobs created in this province. Uh, that, 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 is, that is a real economic benefit, a real economic impact. Yeah. We also have to stop talking about this issue as just one of how much is it gonna cost me? We have to talk about it as an economic imperative. Yeah, but I, I take your point. Uh, and Jeff, what do you think about this? I, I think I, I take the imperative. I take the idea that it should be talked about that way. But people still at the end of the day, as Laura said, uh, you know, will be asked to make certain sacrifices or to mm. pay a certain amount of money in order to accomplish this goal that they say is a priority. And if they're not willing to do that to the degree that is required, mm. how do you rectify that as a political party? Well, that's a real challenge for all the parties. Uh, I think as the campaign goes on, voters are going to look very, very closely at what's on offer. Uh, Mr. Shear's proposal today for a 20% refundable tax credit uh, for renovations up to $20,000, that could mean $3,800 back at tax time to uh, to uh, a homeowner. If they spend the most. If they spend. Now, Mr. Uh, Mr. Trudeau uh, is uh, proposing a huge loan. Well, a loan equals debt. 
uh, for most Canadians. But I mean, how would you, it, the debt that you might also get that tax break by spending twenty thousand dollars that you borrowed? Well, yeah, but you know, uh, he's gonna he's gonna loan you some money. You're gonna have to pay that back, interest free, sure. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. um, I think you know the poll that you mentioned earlier um, points out a real problem. Two thirds of Canadians want serious climate action, uh, and half of them wouldn't pay. Uh, you know, $10 a month for it. So that is, I think, why the Liberals are in trouble with, um, with the approach that they're taking uh, in, in, in creating a, tar a, a carbon tax, which applies to all Canadians. And, you know, the rebate thing, well, if you want to change behavior, why are, they get, you know, why are you giving the money back? Well, well the argument right. is that because the, the rebate comes later, if the price of gas is a little bit more, if you're, you know, if the, if the, on the consumption side, if you're asked to pay a bit more, the idea is that it incentivizes that yeah, behavior. In the right? long run, we're all dead. It's also, it's also <laughs> an idea that was espoused by Stephen Harper's former policy director. Yes, who now works for Jason Kenney, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, there, there's a couple of things that come up here. One, absolutely, Laura put the, you know, put her finger on it. The fact that for most Canadians, the average person, um, it's that, of course, I want to do the right thing, but don't make it hurt. Um, there is a perception issue here, and there's a communication issue here, and nobody has mastered this. I don't know if I've mastered it yet, but I'll give it a good shot here. The fact is that... Um, Climate breakdown, I don't even use the term climate change anymore. Climate breakdown is costing us and will cost us a huge amount of money and jobs and lives. That has to be communicated in much stronger terms mm. and more often. So the fact that it might cost you has to be reframed. So it's right. already costing you. It's going to right. cost you. You may not be able to insure your home anymore or, uh, you know, if we keep going down these roads. I think they actually, so, the Liberals actually put out a thing today saying yeah. claims in Canada related to severe weather are four times higher now than they were in 2008. Yeah. So you've got, you've got, there's prices, which is putting a price on carbon, and there's the actual cost to you. Mm -hmm. That has to be communicated in a, in a subtle but clear way. Um, the other fact, we talk often about a adult conversation. The adult conversation that has to be had here, but which is politically very, very difficult, is that um, you are going to have to pay for this, but that does not have to end up costing you. The, the, to, the, to Jeff's comment here, the reason why you put a price on carbon is when I go to the store or I look at a car or I look at a home and I see, wow, one of those is far more expensive because the price on carbon makes it that way. It's really inefficient. Why don't I go for the more efficient one? Yeah. Then that money that, at the, knowing that that carbon tax money is also going to come back to me in another form, there's very way, various ways of doing this. There's, there's the, the, the tax and dividend or the fee and dividend. Um, there is recycling that money back to people. There is using that money to pay for particular projects, uh, green infrastructure projects. But in the end, the typical Canadian, this is too complicated for them, and I have not yet seen many people in politics who have mastered being able to communicate this to people so that they get, oh, I see, I am going to pay more for this, but that's a good thing and I'm prepared to do that. And everybody else is going to as well, so we're all in this together. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.